So we find ourselves in chapter 37 tonight. Hope you have your Bibles open. If you uh, don't have one, there is one in the chair in front of you. Uh, feel free to take that home to yourself as well, but it's our gift to you. Turn to Ezekiel 37, and we will pray once more. Father, I thank you for this time, for this opportunity to be in your word. Thank you, Lord, for the wonderful things that you've done for us in Christ and uh, the wonderful things that Jesus is yet to do among his people. And I pray, Lord, that you would help us see those things. Help us see your goodness and your power and your glory and your grace tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, we'll name that tune. I won't sing it, but I'll just say the lyrics. Uh, the, the backbone is connected to the shoulder bone. The shoulder bone is connected to the neck bone. The neck bone is connected to the head bone. Now hear the word of the Lord. Dim bones. Dim bones. There you go. You know, that was um, first recorded in 1928. Been around a long time. Uh, Josh James Weldon Johnson is the author. Uh, famous song. Most people, and I remember hearing that as a little kid, but most people have no clue where it comes from. And it's actually based on one of the two signs we'll see in Ezekiel chapter 37. There's two signs in chapter 37, but there's one message. There's first the sign of the bones that are revived into living beings, and then there's the sign of the sticks, or we'll say the branches, unified into one. Now, both symbolize God's promise to regather and revive the kingdom of Israel, giving hope to his people that had been currently stuck, of course, in Babylonian captivity, giving them the promise of a glorious future with him in times to come. So with that in mind, do you ever find it difficult to hold to the promises of God? You know, because sometimes we see those things that we're holding to in Scripture, and we think the longer that it takes, the more difficult it might be to believe. We know, for instance, Jesus is coming to rapture the church, and we're wondering how much longer do we have to wait? We know that Jesus is going to judge the enemy, Satan. We say again, how long? But when is it going to come? You know, we even know in more pressing things, I say pressing just because it's, we deal with this every day, we know Jesus promised never to leave us or forsake us, but then there's other times that we think, well, I just feel really, really alone. You know, if that's difficult for us to hold to some of those promises, imagine how it must have been for ancient Israel, because they had the promises of God of a Davidic king ruling over them in their homeland. But after they're taken to Babylon and a crushing defeat, those promises likely seemed long gone. With their nation destroyed and dead, what hope could they have? What could God possibly do for him, them? And the answer, of course, God could do all those things. God could fulfill each and every single thing that he promised them. It didn't matter how far gone they were as a nation. It didn't matter how divided they seemed to be. It didn't matter how impossible the promises of a Davidic king would be. If God promised it, God would do it. You know, giving life to the dead is not an obstacle to Almighty God. He does this. Really, every single day, somebody comes to faith in Christ. They're raised from spiritual death to spiritual life. But God raises the dead. And he promised to give life and eternal peace to the nation of Israel. That's what he would do. Nothing is too dead for him to revive. He's the life-giving God. So we'll start off with, uh, of course, the sign of the bones. And this is the first 14 verses. But really, firstly, this vision of the valley in verses 1 through 3. Verse 1 says, The hand of the Lord came upon me and brought me out in the spirit of the Lord and set me down in the midst of the valley, and it was full of bones. Then he caused me to pass them all around, and behold, there were very many in the open valley, and indeed, they were very dry. Now, we're not given a time frame for this vision, so it seems that it comes on the heels of the previous chapter. We do know that chapter breaks are not inspired there in the scripture. The text is, but not necessarily the chapter breaks or the, the verse numbers or anything like that. But God earlier promised to regather the nation of Israel for, remember, his own name's sake, not for anything they'd done, but for his own glory. And he said he would multiply them again as a nation. We read that at the end of chapter 36, verses 22 through 38, said all that. An incredible promise, and it would have seemed pretty, you know, much impossible to perform, uh, taking something that's that dead and reviving it. Well, what that look like? It would look like a vision of dry bones. You know, what exactly happened to Ezekiel is uncertain. Was he physically removed to a desert? Was this a spiritual vision of some sort? Whatever took place, it seemed literally real to Ezekiel. That's how he recorded it. Very reminiscent. Remember when John was called up to the throne room of God in Revelation chapter 4? Reminiscent of Paul experiencing a vision of uh, the glories of heaven and not knowing if he was in the body or out of the body, 2 Corinthians 12. You know, Ezekiel, likewise, was taken to this valley full of dry bones. And this place, as he looked around, was desolate, 
but it's gruesome at the same time. It's kind of described as an old battlefield where the bodies are laying out there, scavenged and unburied, dried out by the sun. And it's not skeletons laying on the ground neatly ordered. No, it's a mass of bones everywhere you could look. So something truly horrible had taken place here, and it caused the prophet to inspect it all. And there's an emphasis here on the bones being very dry, right? Like all the moisture had been removed. That's how long they had been sitting there. They were completely baked. That was how long they were under the sun. The idea is this is barren. Not only was everything dead, it looked like it had been dead and abandoned for years, even decades and centuries even on end. And if God wanted Ezekiel to get a picture of a situation that's long past dead, this is it. Okay, so he says, verse 3, And he said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? So I answered, O oh Lord God, you know. At first blush, this seems like a very cryptic question and a cop-out, right? He asked, and one way you could describe this is, Might they come to life, these bones? Obviously, they weren't living at the time, right? There were a bunch of bones. Out of human power, any natural effort, life to these bones seemed utterly impossible. They're scattered about. They're completely dried out. But more than that, they're bones. Life is gone by definition. Uh, They wouldn't be bones otherwise. But even so, Ezekiel gives a very good answer here. Because by themselves, these bones wouldn't have life. But God was involved. God was the one asking the question. So for Ezekiel to turn this question back around on God, this isn't a cop-out. This is the truth. Only the Lord God knows what's possible for whatever is in his will is possible. Now, take a moment and just consider the faith that's involved with this. Can the impossible become possible? God knows. Can that atheist family member come to faith in Christ no matter how many times they rejected him? God knows. Can our nation experience real repentance and revival? God knows. What seems really impossible becomes possible based on the involvement and the will of Almighty God. And Ezekiel did not know the answer, but he understood that if the I am, the ever-existent Lord of Israel, was involved, then whatever God wanted done would come to pass. Ezekiel just needed to trust God and see what God would do. Likewise with us. We don't need to fret about the impossible. We just need to trust the God in whom all things are possible. If it's in his will, it will be done. And so he gives this word to the bones, starting in verse 4. Again, he said to me, prophesy to these bones and say to them, O dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones, surely I will cause breath to enter you and you shall live. I will put sinews on you and bring flesh upon you, cover you with skin and put breath in you and you shall live. Then you shall know that I am the Lord. Speak to the bones. Does it seem silly to speak to a bunch of dead inanimate objects? Well, perhaps, but God is at work, and he wanted his word proclaimed. God's word was declaring God's spirit, and God's spirit gives life. These bones would not remain bones. They would become bodies, and, you know, these bodies, just like ancient Adam did in the Garden of Eden, they would receive the breath, the spirit of God, and they would live. God had a plan for these bones, and that was life, and the result of this would be a testimony unto the Lord. Once more, we see this refrain that's been in almost every single chapter, if not multiple times in Ezekiel, then you shall know that I am the Lord. God's action among the bones could not be ignored. It could not be denied. When God gives life, people know it. By the way, that's true spiritually speaking too. When someone's life is transformed by the Lord, it is evident to all. We are walking testimonies of the Lord Jesus. Verse 7, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise and suddenly a rattling, and the bones came together, bone to bone. Indeed, as I looked, the sinews and the flesh came upon them, and the skin covered them over, but there was no breath in them. It's a miraculous regathering, and you just, you almost wish there was a a visual picture of it. Maybe one day we'll see it in, in retrospect, you know, on a big screen up in heaven or something. You know, Ezekiel spoke to these bones as God commanded him to do, and there was a stirring. You can almost imagine, he speaks, and the reverb and the echo fall silent, There's another sound that arises out there on the bony battlefield. You know, one bone leaps to the next and the next, and all these other bones start leaping to one another, flying around, being reunited with their original partners, assembling into full skeletons, and it doesn't start there. When the bones are reassembled, then muscle and tendons and ligaments and flesh and hair, all that starts sprouting out. Soon enough, it's no longer a valley of bones. It's a valley full of people, fresh and clean, just as if they had fallen asleep on the ground. And even in that, it's only part done. Although what Ezekiel just described was a miracle, Ezekiel was still looking on a field filled with corpses. 
The bodies are assembled, but they're lifeless. Well, not for long. Verse 9, also he said to me, prophesy to the breath, prophesy, son of man, and say to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come for the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and breath came into them, and they lived and stood upon their feet, an exceedingly great army. Now, notice here the emphasis on breath and winds. And you might know that the Hebrew for each of these words is the same single word as it is for spirit, which is ruach. All right? So just as Ezekiel spoke to the bones, he needed to speak to the wind, the breath, the spirit. All that's the same idea. These bodies needed breath, they needed spirit in order to breathe. They needed the spirit, they needed the breath in order to have life. And it is the spirit, the breath. The article here is employed more than once, pointing out a very specific wind or breath or spirit. And just like, again, God breathed his spirit, his breath into Adam for the first man to receive life, so did this multitude of men need a breath of God to come to life. Without it, the miracle is great, but it's only half done. It's great, but it's still doomed to failure. Without God's spirit, it looks wonderful, but it's still lifeless. Guys, the Holy Spirit is not optional. Too often, the third person of the Trinity gets treated like an add-on. It's like when you want to purchase a car, you know you need a transmission. The only question is if you want manual or automatic. You know, if you want to spend the extra money on power steering, that'd be nice, not absolutely necessary. Well, people treat the Holy Spirit that way. That's not the way it is with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is not optional in the life of the believer. He isn't, you know, the part of the God that just sits on the sidelines waiting to find out whether or not a Christian wants to receive them. Understand that without the work of the Holy Spirit, there are no believers in Christ. It's the Holy Spirit who convicts us of our sin, the righteousness of God, and convicts us of the coming judgment, showing us our need to repent, John 16, verse 8. And more to the point here of Ezekiel's vision, it's the Spirit himself who gives us life. Like Jesus said, we need to first be born of the Spirit in order to even see the kingdom of God, John 3, 5. The Holy Spirit is the one who gives us new life. He is the spirit of adoption, Romans 8, 15. He himself is our guarantee of eternity, 1 Corinthians 1, 22. Without the work, without the presence of the Holy Spirit, there are no born-again Christians. Now, that said, there is a work of the Spirit, which too many Christians sadly rarely partake of, and that's the ongoing filling and empowerment he offers. Paul exhorted the Ephesians to be continually filled with the Spirit. Ephesians 5.18, of course, that implies there's something volitional here. Jesus said we could ask for the Holy Spirit, Luke 11.13. The disciples showed they were repeatedly filled with the Holy Spirit once in Acts 2, at least two other times in Acts 4, and other instances from that. So we can ask be repeatedly, continually filled. But the key is to remember that the Spirit is essential. We needed His work just to be saved, Certainly, we need his work to continue in our salvation, walking in the will of God. He is essential for us. And what's the result of the Spirit of God coming into these people? Well, life. Life for everyone. And I love this because there's not just a few risen to their feet. It's an exceedingly great army. And the the Hebrew here is pretty interesting. A literal rendering might be an army great, exceedingly, exceedingly. There's a lot of them there, right? Right? Those who were slain were no longer slain. They now stood to their feet true life. Their numbers were just more than Ezekiel could bother counting. There's just people everywhere. Not a single person is left out. Does God have the power to give life? Yes, he does. Absolutely to everyone. The Spirit of God and his salvation is not limited to just, you know, a select few with anybody else who wants it now left out in the cold. No, the Spirit of God, salvation is available to all who ask. You know, the only way that somebody's left out of the salvation of God is if they never come to faith in Christ. But other than that, it doesn't matter what your background may be. It doesn't matter how dead you might have been in your sins. Guess what? We were all dead in our sins and transgressions. Some people's testimonies may be more dramatic than others, but all of us were in the same place. We're all spiritually dead without Jesus. All of us need the life of the Spirit through faith in Jesus, and that life is available to everyone he doesn't round out, even if the numbers are exceedingly, exceedingly great. There is breath enough for all. Okay, it's a great sign. What does it mean? God explains it. He gives the interpretation starting in verse 11. Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. And they indeed say, Our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves are cut off. So we've got to think of this somewhat like the parables of Jesus. We're not looking for a solid analogy to every single element that's here. 
There's a main point to be made, and God explains it here directly to Ezekiel. The bones were the nation of Israel, both the northern and the southern kingdoms. He says here, the whole house, the whole house of Israel. Both kingdoms, remember, though at different times, had been defeated by enemies. They were carted off into captivity or bred basically out of existence. The, the former Davidic kingdom of Israel is long dead with its bones completely dry. The people of Israel, they knew it. And as they complained here, they believed it was too late. They thought their hope was lost, and they thought God's promises concerning their future were null and void. Was it? No, absolutely not. When God's will is involved, is it ever too late? It's never too late. There are times, of course, that people miss opportunities to freely repent towards God, but does God ever turn his back upon those who repent? No, that's what he wants people to do. And, you know, it's in their captivity that Israel finally would recognize the consequences of their sin. They would turn back to God. And though they had lost much, it was not too much loss for God to restore those years that the locusts had eaten. Not too much for God to regain. He had a plan for his people, and he would see it surely come to pass. Verse 12, Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, O my people, I will open your graves and cause you to come up from your graves. And bring you into the land of Israel. Then you shall know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves. O my people, and I have brought you up from your graves. So this is the equivalent to reassembling the bones. God would bring them up from the graves. He would reassemble the nation of Israel from the dead. Just like the bones were scattered among the valley, so are the nations or the Israelites scattered among the nations of the world. And God had a plan for them even there. And so we say, well, was Israel dead? Yes, they were. By any available metric, they would be considered dead at the time. Their capital city was destroyed. Their king, their monarchy was removed. They were physically removed out of their homeland. They were scattered throughout a vast empire. They were surviving in ghettos in the other nations of the world. They really even had their very little opportunity to practice their religion because, you know, their temple was destroyed and was, you know, thousands of miles off, even if they could get to it, but it was just ruins. Even outside, they're forced to speak other languages rather than the older Hebrew. You say, well, what's left of this nation? Apart from a miracle of God, the Jews would have been otherwise left to the dustbin of history like many other cultures before them. Apart from the miracle of God, they were dead, but it's the miracle of God that made all the difference. And not only did God guard their national identity, he actually brought the nation back together. He promised to reassemble the people just like he reassembled these bones. Tribes were split apart. Families were split apart. But God knew where each one was, and he knew who needed to be rejoined to whom. And so God could open up these metaphoric graves and lead his people back into a national regathering. By the way, when you jump forward to the New Testament, this is one reason why we have every reason to interpret the national regathering of Israel in uh, Revelation chapter 4 as being literal. You might recall at that time, the apostle John becomes a witness to this heavenly census of the 12 tribes of Israel. Uh, They're they're counting 12,000 people in each tribe. They're sealed. Those people are sealed to endure the uh, trials of the great tribulation. And some people, they scoff at the idea that 12 tribes will literally exist during that time. How so? Because People don't know what tribe they belong to today. There are so many genealogical records lost. Hardly any Jews can be absolutely certain of their historic tribe. They may not know, but God knows. And when God brings forth the nation once more from the grave in the future, he knows exactly to which tribe everyone belongs. He can reassemble them exactly as they need to be assembled. And thus the census in Revelation 7 should not be written off as just being symbolic. God knows who belongs to Messianic Israel, He also knows the other saints that are believing in Jesus, and that's seen later on in Revelation 4. And God has a plan for each. Anyway, we move on here, verse 14. I will put my spirit in you, and you shall live. I will place you in your own land, and you shall know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and have performed it, says the Lord. So like the dead bodies, the nation needed more than just reassembled bones and reconstituted flesh to have life. Breath is required, and God promised to give this through his spirit. Now, has this been fulfilled? Well, we could say yes and no. Like many prophecies in the Old Testament, there's aspects of it that had a, you know, a near fulfillment to the people that Ezekiel was speaking to at the time. There's other aspects that have a far fulfillment, some of it which have not yet been fulfilled even today. Yes, God promised his people that were currently in Babylonian captivity that they would be brought out of that land back, it says, into their own land. And yes, he would reform the nation. 
And even to some extent, we can say, yes, he would even give them his spirit. Well, Jesus walked among them, right? He rose from the dead, gave the spirit at Pentecost. So the spirit was in the midst of the nation for sure. But at the same time, it cannot be said that as a whole, the nation of Israel received the Holy Spirit. Why is that? Because they did not receive Jesus as Messiah. Of course, the nation, again, was allowed to be scattered once more, only to be miraculously regathered again in 1948 in modern history. Today, there are Messianic Jews that are a remnant who have the Spirit of God, but the majority of the nation still rejects Jesus, thus they are still without spiritual life. But according to the promise of God, that will change. God promised a time when they shall live, it says here, and they shall. Again, the nation has once more been placed back into their own land. That's a miracle performed again by the living God. All that's needed now is for them to come to faith in Jesus, seeing them as a Messiah, and it will happen. The Apostle Paul, writing to the Romans, said explicitly that thing. Romans chapter 11, verses 25 through 27, For I do not desire, brethren, that you should be ignorant of this mystery, lest you should be wise in your own opinion, that blindness in part has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. And so all Israel will be saved, as it is written, the Deliverer will come out of Zion. And he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob, for this is my covenant with them when I take away their sins. You say, well, that just seems impossible. But God, again, is the God who makes all things possible. God promised to bring them back from the dead and grant them life, and that's exactly what he will do. It is an amazing God that we serve. Whatever God promises, God performs. No promise is too far removed, too far gone. We need to trust him. Okay, so that's the first sign is the bones. The second sign is the branches, or, you know, the, the sticks, the sign of the sticks, starting in verse 15. Again, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, As for you, son of man, take a stick for yourself and ride on it, for Judah and for the children of Israel, his companions. Then take another stick and ride on it, for Joseph, the stick of Ephraim, and for all the house of Israel, his companions. And then join them one to another for yourself into one stick, and they will become one in your hand. So here's the instructions God's giving to Ezekiel. He's to find two sticks, identify them with the two kingdoms, combine them into one as Ezekiel holds them in his hand. Judah and Ephraim represent the southern and northern kingdom respectively. Uh, Joseph, of course, you might recall, was the father of Ephraim, and that's where that name comes in. You say, well, why a stick? Well, technically, the word here isn't stick, it's actually tree, eights, eights, it's tree. And depending on the context, that word eights could be translated as tree, could be translated as woods, forest, all depending on the context. The idea of the stick comes from this image of Ezekiel being able to hold a piece of it in his hand. And it fits very well with the previous idea of the dead bones, if we stop and think about it. Because what is a stick other than a dead piece of a tree? It's a remnant of a tree that's been left behind. Maybe you say, well, maybe it's some other kind of piece of wood, you know, maybe a flatter piece that could be written on, because it's the name written on it, like a piece of lumber. It's still a dead portion of a tree, right? It's separated from the roots, separated from the, the nutrients. The original life has been removed. And so that is a picture that's very fitting for the two kingdoms of Judah and Ephraim. The nation of Israel as a whole is often referred to as a tree throughout prophecy, some type of wood. We see the vine of Isaiah chapter 5. We see the fig tree of Habakkuk. Of course, Romans 11, we talk about the, the olive tree there. And so for God to tell Ezekiel to take two trees or two sticks and make them into one, that has a lot of national significance for the people. You say, well, I don't know. That's kind of a stretch. Well, God even goes so far as to tell Ezekiel to label these according to the kingdoms. Definitely has national significance for the people. Earlier, God promised a restored life, and so now he shows what he's going to be doing with that life. And what was it? Well, that's what God goes on to explain in verse 18. And when the children of your people speak to you, saying, Will you not show us what you mean by these? Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the stick of Joseph, which is in the hand of Ephraim, and the tribes of Israel, his companions, I will join them with it, with the stick of Judah. Make them one stick, and they will be one in my hand, and the sticks on which you write will be in your hand before their eyes. So this whole thing is meant to be a sign for the people. God wanted the people to see these things and wonder. Signs are always a bit curious, and they're designed to be that way. You might recall throughout Ezekiel, God's had Ezekiel perform his share of these things. In just chapter 4, we saw him with a clay tablet. We saw him lying on his side for 
you know, basically years at a time, months at a time. The purpose is get the attention of the people and cause them to wonder what it is. Ask Ezekiel, what is this all about? Asking about the works and the word of God. When people ask about the word of God, it is a good thing. He is getting them to ask. We, we may not have signs like Ezekiel. It might be kind of weird if we did, but we do want to live our lives in such a way that arouses the curiosity of the people. Give them a taste of the love of God so that they can wonder. So God does give an explanation for Ezekiel to share. He's going to go into greater detail in just a minute. What he says is pretty straightforward, though. Out of two nations will be one. God is going to work a miracle of unity. And he explains more when he gives the actual interpretation, starting in verse 21. Then say to them, thus says the Lord God, Surely I will take the children of Israel from among the nations, wherever they have gone, and will gather them from every side and bring them back into their own land. And I will make them one nation in the land. On the mountains of Israel, one king shall be king over them all. They shall no longer be two nations, nor shall they ever be divided into two kingdoms again. So several things here. Number one, he reiterates the regathering. Of course, this was already pictured with the bones. Now it's stated plainly wherever the Israelites had gone, from whatever kingdom they had originated, north or south, God would gather them from every side, bring them back in their land. Right, no matter where they ended up, Babylon, Assyria, Persia, whatever, anywhere in between, they were not lost in the eyes of God. We talk about the lost tribes of Israel. God didn't lose anybody. He knows exactly where they are. He could and would regather them to himself. But more than a gathering, a regathering is a reunification. Remember when East and West Germany were reunified a couple of decades ago now? Same sort of idea here, reunification. There's one nation with one king something that God's going to address more in detail in a moment. But notice, before we get there, how it takes place. It takes place by the miraculous hand of God. Notice the emphasis, I will take, will gather, I will make. These things that are happening is not political negotiation that reunifies the kingdom. This is an accidental circumstance. This is the intentional, powerful act of God. Now keep in mind, historically and politically speaking, what he speaks of here is absolutely impossible. You know, the, no nation that's taken back, taken into captivity, was ever restored back to its former glory, much less one that was already divided by civil war somewhat like three centuries earlier. If God didn't do it, it wouldn't happen. But because God willed to do it, it would. Starting to catch a theme here? There's nothing God can't do. How long would this reunification last? Here he says forever. Never again would they be divided. Never again would there be a split between north and south, between Israel and Judah. There would be one kingdom joined by God forever. God unifies his people. You know, we even see that somewhat today in the church. Jew and Gentile are joined together into one church. Paul wrote of the divisions that once existed between Jew and Gentile being done away with in Christ. Ephesians 2, 14 through 16. For he, may, he himself is our peace, who has made both one and has broken down the middle wall of separation having abolished in his flesh the enmity that is the law of commandments contained in the ordinances, so as to create in himself one new man from the two, thus making peace, that he might reconcile them both to God in one body through the cross, thereby putting to death the enmity. The law of Moses separated Jew and Gentile, and prior to the cross there was an inviolable wall between them. But after the cross, what happened? That wall is abolished. Understand that today there's not two people of God. There's not two ways to get to heaven. There's one body we today live in the church age, and all people who come to faith, no matter what their cultural background, all people who come to faith in Christ are made part of the church. Sure, there's Jewish Christians, there's Gentile Christians, but there's one church, there's one body of Christ, one bride. We are unified in the cross and the resurrection of our Lord Jesus. Now keep in mind, unity doesn't mean that there are never any distinction, distinctions. Today there's one body, but as we're seeing here in the text and elsewhere in Scripture, is there a difference between Israel and the church in the future? Well, yes, there is. The church, we, will be raptured prior to Jesus' second coming. The nation of Israel, at that point, reconstituted, revived, given the Spirit of God, we see here, at least at Jesus' second coming. The kingdom of Israel will literally exist upon the earth during the millennial rule of Christ. Where's the church? Well, the church is Jesus' bride. We're reigning and ruling alongside him. So we have different backgrounds, different roles, but even then, we still have one king. That's our King Jesus. 
Unity isn't the only thing that Israel is going to experience into eternity. As it goes on, it also talks about an eternal purity as well, actually in like three different aspects. Verse 23, they shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols, nor with their detestable things, nor with any of their transgressions. But I will deliver them from all their dwelling places in which they have sinned and will cleanse them. They shall be my people and I will be their God. So the first thing is that they are forever pure in worship. Forever pure in worship, free from idolatry. The history of Israel, when you read through it, is a really sad one because it's filled with all kinds of idolatry, all kinds of departure from the singular worship of the living God. Well, not so in the future. During the millennial kingdom, they'll worship God in truth. as God always intended for them. Secondly, they're going to be forever pure in action, free from transgression and sin. Of course, idolatry isn't the only temptation for Israel to have away from God. One of the most prevalent, but not the only one. There are other sin. By the way, if you're following on in, in, in NIV, you might have a different translation here. There's some textual questions about the phrase, um, uh, deliver them from their dwelling places. Some ancient texts have two Hebrew letters switched, making it read, deliver them from their backslidings, which actually makes a little bit more sense in the context. But either way, God made it plain that they had sinned, they needed to be cleansed, and God promised that that cleansing would come. They would always be clean. So free from uh, idolatry, free from sin. Third, free from uh, pure in service. They're free of slavery to the nations. Whose people would they be? God says he w- they would be his own people. They would know him in truth. They would find their identity in him alone. And again, that's exactly what God had always intended for them. Now, in listing those things, you might notice that what's promised for future Israel is what's presently available for every New Testament believer in Christ. We are free from idolatry. How so? Because we worship the living God. We've seen the image of the invisible God in Jesus Christ. We are free from sin, being cleansed from its past stain upon us. We are free from slavery, finding our liberty in the Lord Jesus. Not only are we forgiven and cleansed from our past, but we have the power to live for God's glory right now in the present. We are free. We don't want to give that up for anything. Once Christ has made you free, you are free indeed. So what is it then that uh, reconstituted, reunited Israel will do? Well, they will serve somebody. They will serve the Lord Jesus. Look at verse 24. David, my servant, shall be king over them. They shall all have one shepherd. They shall also walk in my judgments and observe my statutes and do them. Then they shall dwell in the land that I have given to Jacob, my servant, where your fathers dwelt. And they shall dwell there, they, their children, and their children's children forever. My servant David shall be their prince forever. As the son of David, as the heirs of the Davidic kingdom, Jesus is the forever king of Israel. Now, as far as the literal David, the resurrected David, surely he'll have a role in the the kingdom, as all of God's resurrected saints will. But the most likely interpretation here of David, the king David, is the Lord Jesus himself. He is the king of kings. He is a good shepherd. He's the ultimate king of Israel. One day all Israel will see him as the Lord. But ultimately, God is what? Describing the fulfillment of the Davidic covenant. We're still... A little out from Christmas, and I would discourage playing any Christmas songs until after Thanksgiving. But you might remember the Christmas prophecy of Isaiah, which speaks about this. Isaiah 9, 6, and 7 says, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government will be upon his shoulder. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. Here it is. Of the increase of his government and peace, there will be no end. Upon the throne of David and over his kingdom to order it and establish it with justice, judgment and justice from that time forward, even forever, the zeal of the Lord of hosts will perform this. The king to rule in the seat of David is none other than the son of David himself, who personally oversees a perfect kingdom inhabited by the nation of Israel. And they will walk in his ways. He will lead them in justice. He will lead them in majesty. Isn't it a glorious thing in the the week of a national election to to remember the fact that we're going to spend far more time in the kingdom of God? than we will in the United States of America. No matter who you may have voted for, the very best leader in the world is King Jesus. Nobody compares with him. So you've got the covenant of really Abraham, Moses, and David being fulfilled in the millennium, but you might notice there's a promise of a new covenant on the horizon. There's a covenant of peace that we see in verse 26. Moreover, I will make a covenant of peace with them, and it shall be an everlasting covenant with them I will establish them and multiply them. I will set my sanctuary in their midst forevermore. My tabernacle also shall be with them. Indeed, I will be their God. They shall be my people. 
the nations also will know that I, the Lord, sanctify Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. So this new covenant of peace, of shalom, of wholeness, of absolute fulfillment that's already been alluded to by uh, God to Ezekiel. Last week we saw in chapter 36, again, verse 26 and 27, he spoke of the new heart and the new spirit that he put in his people, that they would walk according to his ways. This promise is the same promise that God gave to Jeremiah about the new covenant that he was making with his people when he would write their law in their hearts and minds, Jeremiah 31. Unlike the covenant of Moses, which had stipulations for both parties to fulfill God in Israel, which obviously Israel failed on multiple times, that's the reason why they were in captivity. The new covenant, this is a one-sided covenant. God bears all the burden there. This is his promise to his people, and so he would see that it came to pass. We need to remember anytime we talk about the new covenant that what Israel awaits in the future is what we enjoy today. When we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we celebrate with the cup of the new covenant, Jesus called it, Matthew 26, 28. Jesus shed his blood precisely so that we might be brought into that covenant relationship. And so we are his people, been given an eternal peace, shalom with him. And so what's included in this new covenant? Well, the presence of God. He repeatedly mentions his sanctuary or his tabernacle here. This is a symbol of his dwelling place among him. A tabernacle could actually be translated place of dwelling itself. So it's emphasized that he's there. He's living with them. He's living among his people. This is going to be described in far greater detail in the later chapters of Ezekiel. We'll get to the dimensions of the, the millennial temple. We'll get to the duties and the things that go on there. But for now, it's the promise of God's presence that's emphasized. God's presence among them. Now, put yourself in the sandals of the, the, the Jews at the time in captivity and think how comforting this would have been. Because the very last thing they would have felt out in Babylon by the river Kibar or wherever else they were would have been the presence of God. That was thousands of miles away in Jerusalem in their mind. They mourned the destruction of the Jerusalem temple. God's presence was removed from them. Yet that destruction was not permanent. And just as God promised to revive his nation, he promised to revive their worship. His dwelling would be among them again. His presence would be among them again. And they would know and they would see him as their God. Guys, is the presence of God among us today? Absolutely. And this is another one of the blessings of the Holy Spirit. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. He will never be taken from us. Understand there is no place you go that the Lord God is not with you. He is in you. He indwells you. The presence, the dwelling of God is with you. And of course, we've got the promise of heaven when we get there and Jesus himself will dwell among us. The the dwelling of him will be with us. Well, that is the tabernacle. Amazing. Amazing. So finally, this prophecy ends with the the nations bearing witness to God's work among the the people because they see God's presence among the people. And that day, the Gentiles will know that the kingdom of Israel is sanctified. They're set apart from everybody else. How so? Because God is among Israel. They see him there. And so they know they're different. You say, that's favoritism. Yeah, it's favoritism. But it's the fulfillment of the promise of God. The salvation of God originates with the Jews and spreads out to the rest of the world. Gentiles understand are not going to be forbidden from coming to faith in Christ, serving Jesus as their king, quite to the contrary. Anyone who's willing to serve the Lord Jesus can serve the Lord Jesus, but they see example among Israel first. And that was God's plan for Israel all along. So the nations would see them and see that's what it could be like. Understand that's part of the reason we're going out witnessing within the world so people would see us and they can see that's what it's like to be transformed by the living God. And they can see it in our lives, see example here, and then follow Jesus for themselves. Does all this sound impossible? Well, maybe. You know, we're talking about bringing dead people back to life, dead nations back to life. Talking about reuniting kingdoms that were irreparably separated in centuries past. Those things seem really impossible for men. We can't barely keep ourselves together, much less to attend to these things. But for God, nothing is impossible. What God promises to do, he does. So why should the resurrection of Israel seem impossible? Our whole faith is based on the resurrection of Jesus. If the Son of God can rise from the dead, surely the kingdom of Israel can. Never doubt the promises of God. He is able. For some, there might be some things in your life that seem dead. 
There may be some promises of God that to you just seem absolutely impossible. It might seem that way, but they're not. Trust God according to his word. What he said he will do, he will do. Big or literal, if it's a promise of God, you can be sure it's going to come to pass. As Paul wrote, let God be true and every man a liar. So be done with the stress and anxiety over those things that might or might not happen. Trust God for a sovereign will. Going back to the Lord's Prayer, Lord, let your kingdom come, your will be done, knowing that he's going to do all things for his glory. For others here tonight, you know, you might find it impossible to trust God in this way for one simple reason. You don't know Jesus as your God. You haven't received of his forgiveness. You haven't been brought in that covenant relationship with God, but you can tonight. All you need to do is turn away from your sins, put your faith in Christ, and you can do that right now as we pray. Father, I thank you so very much, first of all, for the forgiveness that we have in Jesus, for the relationship we have with you because of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, for the invitation that goes out to the entire world that anybody who turns away from their sin who trusts Jesus to be and believes him to be God in the flesh, crucified for his sin, risen from the dead, who's asked him to forgive them their sins, be their savior, they are saved. Lord, you don't cast away any who come to Jesus by faith. So I thank you that the invitation has gone out for people to trust Jesus by faith today and be transformed by his grace. And Lord, if there's any among us today that need to do that, help them do that right now. Help them grab hold of the promises of Christ. Surrender their lives to him and be forever changed. Beyond that, Lord, I thank you for your promises, which are so true. Not a single one of them will fail. And Lord, that's true regarding the eternal and that's true regarding the promises you have for us right now in the present. And I pray that we would cling to those things, that we would trust you for those things, knowing that you are good to your word. I do ask, Lord, that you would fill us anew with your spirit, continually walk in your power, knowing that you are always with us. I thank you, Lord, and we pray these things in Jesus' name.